Guédelon in France. To understand how castles were constructed, they're building one from scratch, using just the tools and materials of the medieval age. It's a 25-year project, the world's biggest archaeological experiment. The most important defensive feature of any castle was the wall surrounding it. Castle walls had to be incredibly thick in order to resist attack and absorb the impact of projectiles fired from trebuchets. The curtain wall was over 20 feet deep, interspersed with towers. In earlier Norman castles, they were square. But while on crusade, European knights saw that eastern towers were round. They realized that eliminating corners not only made them stronger, but also provided a better view of the surrounding landscape. Completing the walls will take some 30,000 tonnes of sandstone. Transport costs in the Middle Ages were incredibly expensive. So having a good supply of local stone close to the castle was vital. To extract it from the quarry, first a row of holes is hand-drilled. Once all the holes are ready, I'm ready to put in the iron wedges and I'm ready to split it open by hitting very hard on each wedge with a big sledgehammer. The stone is split into usable blocks, then transported using horsepower and human effort. This treadwheel crane can lift up to half a ton. The walls are built like sandwiches. On the outside, you have facing walls built from better quality stones. And the inside, the rubble cores, they're built with softer stones and other offcuts from the quarry. And they're built up in layers with a very thick, coarse mortar. This ingenious method makes the walls better able to withstand hits from a trebuchet. Sandstone is too hard to be carved into intricate windows, vaults and steps. Instead, softer, more expensive limestone is used. These sophisticated building techniques make castles the ultimate feats of medieval engineering. It's a testament to their construction that so many still stand today. One weapon more than any other dominated warfare in the Norman period, the crossbow. century crossbows like this were the culmination of centuries of development. With limbs made of steel, they were incredibly powerful. But earlier Norman crossbows had limbs made of wood. There was a limit to how powerful these wooden bows could be. So the idea that Norman crossbows were a powerful weapon is really a myth. Despite this, they were effective at medium range, and that was enough in battle. Drawing the bow repeatedly took a lot of strength. Thankfully, help was at hand. A crossbowman spanned his weapon with a device called a belt and claw. This gave him extra leverage, allowing him to use his back and legs to draw the string. Crossbowmen were vulnerable on a battlefield, so they carried large shields called pavises, so they could hunker down behind, load, pop up, shoot, and then duck back down again to reload. Crossbows were accurate, took less training, and used cheaper ammunition than the longbow. Most importantly, you could wait to take your shot, so they were perfect for siege situations. To protect crossbowmen when they were defending castles, they used specially built wooden galleries called hoardings. But shooting down towards an approaching enemy presented its own problems. 
how to stop the bolt from falling off the crossbow before it could be shot. What they did is just place the thumb loosely on the top of the bolt, which is just enough with light pressure to hold it in place. Around 1200, the Norman wooden crossbow was superseded by a new design, the composite bow. With limbs made from horn and sinew, they could be made more compact than a wooden bow. And they could deliver up to four times the punch. They were, however, more expensive. So whether on the battlefield or the castle rampart, simple wooden crossbows remained the main weapon of the day. By 1100, the medieval knight was dressed from head to toe in mail. Mail is really like a metal fabric. It moves and behaves like a cloth, but is actually made of hundreds and thousands of interlocking iron rings. It could turn and deflect a sword blade. As an armor, mail didn't work all by itself. It needed the addition of a padded coat The coat absorbed the shock of the blow, whilst the male turned away the cut. Together, they formed an incredibly effective protection. The first stage in making mail was to create wire to the right thickness. To do this, it was pulled through a drawing plate, which had a series of ever smaller holes, until you got wire of the desired gauge. To make the rings, we wind the wire onto a mandrel. And then we take it off the mandrel and cut the rings. So I've flattened the overlapping ends of the ring and I've pierced a hole through it. And now Nick has to put a rivet in it. The basic construction of mail would be a ratio of four to one. So each ring goes through four of its fellows. Here you can see I've made a set of five, which will then be joined to other sets of five to create a sheet of mail. Mail had to be tailored to a perfect fit. It had to be shaped for feet and legs, arms and hands, and of course the head. A skilled mail maker could make very precise shapes. Of course, for more complicated parts of the body, like elbows, we can actually tailor it in two different directions at the same time. Yeah, so if we fold this in half, we have an elbow. One of the main benefits of tailoring in mail was that it meant a knight didn't have to carry a single ring of extra weight that he didn't need to. The mail to cover a knight from head to toe required about 200,000 rings. High-status knights would have had their mail edged with gold, but most importantly, it had to be functional. Clad in mail with his shield and helmet, the knight was well-equipped to face the weapons of the day. Norman domination over England was marked by their imposing castles and new laws. But one passion of theirs also impacted the land, hunting. The Norman nobility, both men and women, shared a love of hunting with birds of prey. To preserve their hunting grounds, they took ownership of the land and outlawed hunting by commoners. Falcons hunt by flying to a great height, then dive bombing their prey. They are kept hunting fit using a lure, a pad of leather with bait attached. This prepared them for catching their prey, usually other birds such as rooks and pheasants. While out hunting, a falcon might give chase to its prey far from the party. So, riders would follow them cross-country on horseback to witness the action. 
after a falcon had caught its prey, it was fed and would not fly again that day. This meant many birds had to be taken on a hunt to keep the nobility entertained. Rather than falcons being carried on horseback, which would jostle them, they were transported on a frame called a cadge. Although falconry was a horseman's sport, hawking was enjoyed on foot. Hawks, unlike falcons, have broad wings and hunt by following their prey in straight flight, often low to the ground through woodland. Hunting by sight, a falcon's vision is highly developed. When not hunting, they were kept calm by putting on a leather hood. The darkness stopped them becoming overstimulated and restless. Lords of the sky, controlled by the lords of the land. Falcons and hawks were symbols of power and status. They were central to Norman identity. A counterweight trebuchet was the king of all siege engines. A catapult capable of smashing down castle walls from great distances. At Warwick Castle in England, they've built a replica, one of the largest in the world. Originating in 7th century China, by the 13th century, trebuchets had evolved into devastatingly powerful weapons. Such a simple design, but so effective. It has several key features. A pivoted arm with a weight at one end and a sling to hold the projectile at the other. To prime, the six-ton weight is raised using tread wheels. So this is one of the wheels, one of two, that's attached to an axle, which would lift the counterweight, weighing six tons. It's based on muscle power alone. What's essential about launching a projectile as far as possible is making sure that this end of the arm is moving as fast as possible. So once that weight drops, it really sends this point of the arm moving at its highest velocity. This was done by positioning the pivot close to the counterweight and by launching the projectile from a sling. When released, the sling whips round, vastly increasing the launch speed. Trebuchets were carefully aimed, like modern guns. In order to weaken the castle walls or even breach them, you had to make sure that the projectiles hit the same spot every single time. For each projectile to follow the same trajectory, they all had to be the same weight and shape. To achieve this, masons used a gauge. Now, I'm going to load this projectile into the sling. This one must weigh about 25 kilograms, but some projectiles can get up to 150 kilograms. That's the weight of two men. Trebuchets were also used to throw burning tar, beehives, even dead bodies. Anything to cause maximum distress to the enemy. Did you hear that whoosh? It was the counterweight trebuchet's lethal combination of power and accuracy that made it the ultimate medieval siege weapon. People often imagine that castle walls were just left as bare stone, but in fact they weren't. They were plastered, painted and decorated. The process of making medieval paint begins in a quarry. This is a sandstone with a really high iron content. In it, we find pockets of ochre. 
This is iron oxide, like rust, and the ochre is one of the main ingredients in pigment making. First, the ochre is crushed into a fine powder. The finer the particles in paint, the better the paint will be. Once ground up, water is added. Then the mixture is sieved. This is the exact opposite of making pasta at home. At home, when you sieve your pasta, you then keep it for your meal. Here, what's going to end up in the sieve will be discarding. What's needed are the tiny particles suspended in the water. Once it's dry, it's going to look something like this. You can see that all the water has evaporated leaving just this very fine crust, which will then be ground into the fine pigment which is used to make paint. But ochre's colour palette doesn't end there. If it's heated, something magical happens. Yellow ochre turns red. And heating it for even longer, creates a whole spectrum of colours. It's been burnt for over 72 hours at 1,000 degrees Celsius, and that gives us this incredible purple colour. To turn the pigment into paint, it's bound together with egg and tree sap. A popular motif in the Middle Ages was the use of stones and roses. That's where you paint on blocks of stone to make it look like you could afford to pay stonemasons to produce dress blocks of stone and then decorate them with five-petaled flowers. So, medieval castles were far from the gloomy places we imagine today. They were full of colour and light. <laughs> 